for me, the work that we're doing is just like being on a 15-foot tube ride. It's amazing. You get the same kind of adrenaline and, and uh, same kind of feeling of satisfaction that, that we're doing something um, pretty extreme and, and pretty meaningful with, with our lives. They came from different backgrounds, but found a common purpose in their personal and professional lives. This couple is working overtime to protect nature, culture, and community. Chipper and Hau Oli Wickman are next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. In this edition of Long Story Short, you might think taking care of gardens would be a mellow line of work. But for Chipper and Hauoli Wickman, it's a high stakes 24 7 venture. This couple complements each other at work and at home, and together they've forged a life, a profession, and a mission to preserve nature and culture in Hawaii and beyond. The Wickman story starts with a seed planted decades ago by Chipper's grandmother that has grown into a garden tended with passion and intensity by this dedicated duo. Tell me about each of your backgrounds. What was, what was it like growing up when and where you grew up? Chipper? Well, uh, born in 1957 and uh, um, Hawaii then was really so much more relaxed. I remember never having to lock the doors on the house. And we spent every summer on Kauai with, with my grandmother, which is really was very, um, it's just one of those fond memories that really influenced us in, in the course of, of our life. Yeah. And what were your interests as a kid? Well, started with baseball and stuff like that, but graduated pretty quickly into, into water sports and loved surfing. Surfing became really um, pretty much the focus of my life as I was growing up. And did you have a vision in your head at that time of gardens? Not at all. I was not on the garden or plant track at all. You it were was all like water. surf, 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 and when the surf wasn't good, we'd go diving and really just enjoyed growing up around the ocean and, and being part of that. Now your parents sent you to, you to some very private Pricey schools, Hanahauoli, Punahou, yeah. and your dad was an attorney, mm -hmm. um, but you didn't continue in the private school mode. You went to a public school, Roosevelt, for your high school years. Yeah, I guess you could say maybe I was a challenging teenager and uh, didn't probably really appreciate the uh, opportunities they were giving me in terms of education when, when I was growing up. So we uh, had a little parting of the ways, and, and uh, I really enjoyed going to, to Roosevelt. And for me, you know what it did also is Roosevelt with Papakalea right there, it really connected me with our Hawaiian community. That was a real uh, benefit for me. And certainly, you know, I think to a large degree, Punho recognizes that and celebrates the fact that, you know, we're here in Hawaii and the Hawaiian culture. But you get to a place like Roosevelt where you know, it's not pretend, it's for real. And, and uh, um, back in that day, there was still Kill Holiday, Day. And so, you know what How I mean? How did you fit into that scenario? Hey, I made friends with the, with the biggest smokes right away, man. <laughs> that, was, that was my And buddies. that worked. Yeah, sure was good because, you know, in the end, people really see right through your exterior and see who you are on the inside, what kind of a person you really are and what your values are. And I think that was... Uh, what made me successful at Roosevelt. Do you have regrets about not being more into school at the time? Very much so. I didn't really truly appreciate that until after I had worked for several years at the garden and, and had an opportunity to go back to school. And, and when I did, um, I went to UH Manoa, got in through the community college system, and what I found was really amazing. I saw a lot of um, kids that were 18 year olds and they were there because mom and dad said you got to go to school you got to go to university after you graduate and uh, they didn't have a strong interest they weren't driven I was there totally like a sponge and it was like for me it was awesome whereas I practically almost flunked out of high school I graduated from UH Mano with a 4.0 uh, and you went on to get a master's Kappa, you know yeah. I mean so it's more than the grades and everything it was it was a learning opportunity and I've continue to benefit from that for, for my entire life. So it's really, um, I regret not having um, taken advantage of those opportunities my parents provided for me. But on the other hand, 
um, everything in my life has been has been there for a reason. I don't regret the fact that I got to really connect with our with our Hawaiian community at, at, at that early age. The school of Papakolea is a good school. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Still get plenty of friends in there. So Chipper, it seems like you were born in, from a privileged Kama'aina family, mm -hmm. grew up in uh, Honolulu, mm -hmm. mostly, and you're from a, a Nanakuli family of modest means. You're the mm -hmm. first person in the family to go to college. That's correct. And how old are you? Tell me about your um, background in Nanakuli. Yes, so I grew up in Nanakuli, born and raised there, um, born in 58, so Farmington Highway was two lanes, and um, my grandparents, we lived in their, my grandparents' home, and later um, we moved next door because my, my aunt lived next door, but she moved to Mauna Wili. So we were always with grandma and family was always around. Um, the aunties and uncles that lived in the neighborhood, was, everyone was our cousins and we played and went to the beach and just enjoyed life out there in the country. And went to public schools in the area? Yes, um, Nani Kapono Elementary, then Nana Kuli Intermediate. Well, tell me about your dad, because you have this great story about <laughs> him digging holes. Well, he um, graduated from Waipahu High School and got a job at Hawaiian Electric. And um, his first, well, one of his first jobs, he was a laborer, and he had to dig the holes for the electric poles. He um, became a foreman and um, eventually um, retired from Maui Electric, where he was a superintendent of construction there. That's right, you moved to Maui mm -hmm. for your, uh, is it high school or, or college high school. years? High school, yeah, I was 14 and then we moved, our whole family, I'm the oldest of five, and we all, we moved and my dad um, started working there in the early 70s. At first as a foreman and then um, the superintendent when he retired. What was it like moving from Nanakuli to what part of Maui? Right in Kahului. Mm -hmm. Well, it was um, a big change for me and um, I was kind of wondering, should I stay in Nanakuli and live with my grandparents? But no, we just all moved together to Maui and the school I attended was Maui High. So it was a feeder school in all country folks from upcountry and pa'i and haiku mm -hmm. all came into this one school so it was really easy it wasn't like I was coming in as a stranger everyone came together at the school so everybody had to meet at exactly the school. yeah though they didn't know each other at the time Chipper Wickman also went from Oahu to a neighbor island at about the same age but for very different reasons as Chipper recalls his parents had reached the end of the rope with their 15 year old son They were a little worried about you for a while back they there. They were very <laughs> worried. They were very worried. And you, you never appreciate that until you become a parent. Oh, and, how did they act you, when you were kind of acting up at, at, at Punahou? Well, um, they may have a different recollection of it, but I think I'd really driven them to their wit's end. And uh, fortunately, my grandmother was willing to take me in. So I actually went to live on Kauai with my grandmother during that very... I'd say it's a pretty stressful period of time for them. Which turned out to be formative in your life because she would eventually uh, encourage you to get an internship in horticulture. That's right, that's right. I mean, she, she really, she was a, a woman of great vision and really ahead of her time. And she was uh, such a champion of the Hawaiian culture and, and as well as plants. She was working to preserve native plants when she was growing up. She was born in 1901. So, I mean, people hadn't even truly appreciated our native flora and, and understood its threats uh, back then. So really an amazing woman who, who um, provided for me those, those seeds of conservation and, and research and, and, and culture that have grown into, into really um, the values that have, have driven me in my life. And you two met at UH Manoa, right? Yeah, That's correct. Tell, <laughs> tell us about the meeting. <laughs> Actually our first class we had together was ethnobotany, which is very appropriate considering our lives are so involved with plants. And uh, our, our teacher at the time, uh, Dr. Isabella Abbott, was, oh. who recently passed away, yes. is really an icon in the, in the plant world. And, and so being able to have her, she was in her prime back then, you know, 30 years ago. And so it was really, I was really looking forward to that class. Did sparks fly in ethnobotany? 
Not really. We actually knew, we, we saw each other, but we barely talked. But we do recognize that was where we first saw each other. <laughs> it was other. a big, huge yeah. auditorium mm -hmm. classroom, so there was a lot of people there. And when did you meet in earnest? <laughs> Actually in Hawaiian language class a couple of semesters later. And uh, Ho'oli's um, grandmother on her, on her father's side was Mama Hale. And Mama Hale was one of the mana leo, or really the kupuna who helped um, re bring the language back after the Constitutional Convention. And she was somebody I had actually gotten to know very, very well and didn't even realize it was Haoli's oh. tutu lady. So um, later we, actually our first date was to go to her grandma's birthday party. Grandparents played pivotal roles in the lives of Haoli and Chipper Wickman. Between high school and college, Chipper's grandmother, Juliet Rice Wickman, urged him to apply for an internship with the National Tropical Botanical Garden. Little did he know that he would make his career there, working his way from intern to CEO. Since 2003, Chipper has run the Garden Organization, a family of tropical gardens and preserves across Hawaii and also in Florida. It really is an amazing organization chartered by the United States Congress as a nonprofit, and that's really confusing to people. How did that even come to be? The vision was our founders wanted to see um, this organization funded privately with, with private money and not being uh, just another federal agency. Um, but having that congressional charter really set the bar high. It was clear that this organization um, had a destiny that needed to be fulfilled in terms of making a global difference. And um, that means today for us, uh, working on a, not only a, a regional scale here and helping to, to really fulfill immediate needs here in Hawaii in terms of stopping extinction of plants and helping to preserve our culture and, and meeting educational needs. We really have a three-pronged focus, education, scientific research, and conservation. And we fulfill all of those on both local, national, and, and international scales. How about telling um, me a couple of things that um, people may not know about the garden? We are a nationally chartered organization chartered by the United States Congress, but that idea, that thought, came out of the Honolulu Garden Club by very visionary women, including uh, Lloyd McCandless Marks, who was the president. Um, I was recently given a packet of the minutes of the Garden Club meetings from like 1954, 1955, um, when they talked about creating this organization. And uh, it's amazing to see how it went from um, from a Garden Club meeting all the way to be to succeeding in convincing the United States Congress that this was indeed. Uh, an action worthy of, uh, of a public law. We have the world's largest collection of endangered species, uh, federally listed endangered species. It's really amazing collection of plants, but it's not what the visitor is typically, typically looking for, like the beautiful bird of paradise that are right behind your heliconia. We have amazing plants, um, but they aren't collected or arranged or displayed Are they, for, home, are for they their homely beauty. little plants? Is that what you're saying? Many of them are, but <laughs> some are majestic trees, and, but they're not, they're not what the average visitor expects when they come to see a botanical garden. Our gardens have really been developed by scientists and conservationists as these living laboratories. It's time for us to make them public venues so that the public can come and really get a better understanding of some of these global issues and, and what we're dealing with. There, there is no better way to convey that than in the beauty of a botanical garden. In 1987, three years after Chipper and Haoli Wickman were married, their family and professional lives once again collided. Chipper's grandmother passed away and left him the thousand-acre Limahuli Valley on Kauai. It was not exactly a gift, but a duty to carry out her vision of protecting the valley's natural and cultural resources. That this was a kuleana, that this was a responsibility to um, preserve it in perpetuity. But more than just preserve it, this was an area that was crying out for active management. Mm -hmm. And um, it took us seven years, but we succeeded um, in getting the state to create a special subzone called the Limahuli Valley Special Subzone and approve a very active, um, comprehensive management plan, a master plan for it. 
And today it's considered really one of the poster childs in the state in terms of biocultural conservation, celebrating the, the importance of the area as a, as a cultural area to Native Hawaiians and restoring the cultural um, the cultural values, practices, as, as well as plants. After your grandmother, Juliet Rice Wickman, gave you the kuleana, you in turn gave it. Yes, right. We gifted that property in 1994 to the, to the garden after we had put in place the special cell zone, after we knew that indeed the, the garden could um, properly manage it. Um, and when we gave that property away, our kids were pretty young. So our son was born in 85, this was 94, he was nine and our daughter was seven. So here we were, we gave away the only piece of property we ever owned. And they looked at us like, mom and dad, are you nuts or what? And, and uh, in fact, I think they thought we were pretty nuts anyways, raising them out in Hyanna at the end of the road without TV or radio. And, and um, in those days, it was, it seemed more remote. It was much more yeah. remote. And you know, it was not nearly as crowded as, as it is today. And the traffic was less. It was, it was really, really wonderful. But what impressed them uh, were the values that they grew up with and later as they got older and, and especially after they went to Kamehameha School and University of Hawaii, they look back on that with so much pride and they're so um, proud to bring their friends and show them their home and where they grew up and they're very proud of what we accomplished with, with that property and the gift of it. It was an important experience for us in, in terms of um, learning how to fulfill a kuleana, what it really means to malama aina. And, and to care for the land because far too often we think of aina as as a commodity to be bought and sold and that its highest and best use is the is the economic return you can get from it when indeed aina has so much more to offer us. Haole, at what point did you get passionate about Chipper's dream, the garden? And, and because you, you do it 110 <laughs> percent so you can't be lukewarm about it. Well it's after our children were grown up and um, we started managing the Kahanu Garden in Hana, and um, it, then you know I realized it was serious work, and there was a lot to do, and there was a, a bigger kuleana out there. And you had family out there, so you yeah. saw mm -hmm. community connections building. Oh, definitely, and that was very important for us to come into a small community, Hawaiian community, but having family there was um, made it so much easier for us to get to know the other people there and um, accomplish what we needed to do in taking care of Kahanu Garden and the Pi'ilani Haleheau. How long have you worked together now? Well, we've worked in an official employment capacity probably for close to 15 years. But before that, she was really helping as a volunteer. How long have you been married? 28 years this year. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So you've got to give us some, some relationship tips because you, you are together constantly and you have such a good relationship. How does that happen? Or are you, are you, are you good at pretending? Mm -hmm. No, I don't <laughs> think you can pretend for 28 years. <laughs> He's the boss. <laughs> well, you know, I think relationships, it's hard work. And I, and I hope that our, if nothing else, we can convey that to our kids is, is we really, really understand and believe that um, the future of our, of our island, of our, of our uh, communities are dependent on strong families. And um, maintaining a marriage is never easy. It's, it's give and take, and it's being able to really hear and understand the other person. Um, I think I, she'll tell you, I do all the talking and this. And, it's, it's hard sometimes when you are a, have a dominant personality to slow down and, and be a good listener. Um, so that's something that I, I really try and practice. She said I'm the boss, but I think she's, she's got some very, very valuable ideas and, and, um, and feelings. And when I really stop and, and listen to them, she's almost always right. What do you do when you can tell he's not listening? Sometimes she jokes around, I gotta send you an email even though I'm sitting three feet away from you to get your attention. Because our life is so busy, I think it, that can be frustrating. Communication is so important. And being able to have common activities that you enjoy doing together. Mm -hmm. I think many couples end up going different ways because they don't have enough common enjoyment together. And so, you know, one takes off in this direction, the other one takes off in that direction. And, 
and, and before long, your lives are kind of heading in, in, in very different directions. Mm -hmm. For us, we're probably the extreme example of the other, you know. How much time on a typical day do you spend together? <laughs> 24 all, hours. All the time? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. How do you do that? Well, you know, it's not for every couple, but the requirement of, of the work they were involved in, 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 in leading a major nonprofit organization, as, you, as I'm sure you well know, <laughs> you live it yourself, is, is pretty consuming. And, and for us, it's, it's given us a chance to be able to do it together and, and be mm -hmm. together. Holy said something several, many years ago. She goes, you know, it's a good thing we do this together, otherwise we'd never see each other. And especially now with the extensive itinerary and travel schedule we have to do being involved at, with a national board and international programs, um, that's truly, that, that's really true. And, and I feel very blessed that um, she's really embraced it and, and, and enthusiastically made it a part of her life. And I can honestly say I would not be sitting here having this interview if it wasn't for her and all the support that she's, she's done. It also means there isn't a whole lot of separation between work and home because we go home and we're eating dinner and we're talking about work. But you know what? That's our life. You and have so to both be passionate about it or it doesn't work, right? Exactly. Yeah. What do you contribute, how Ole is, and how, do, how, how does your working partnership go? I mean, usually it boils down to who's better at what, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I just kind of, I guess, keep him organized and pick up all the loose ends and try to, you know, just do the the housekeeping and he's just going forward and you know just a lot of meetings a lot of telephone conferences and so I'm just in the background mostly yeah, and you've heard him described as the man with the big vision mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's true isn't it Chipper you don't you think big you're not you're not do, you're not making small plans that's right yeah when they asked me to become the CEO of, of this national organization I knew in fact we talked extensively about it, we knew that it would be a major change in lifestyle. We'd have to move from our family home where we raised our children and it would mean extensive traveling and really um, giving up almost everything we, we were previously doing in, in order to, um, to take this on. But it also meant that it, it gave us an opportunity to really make a difference on a global scale. It's been an amazing journey for us. and, and uh, I think Haoli is, a, is excessively modest. She does not like the limelight. And when we have all these international meetings, she isn't up there at the podium giving presentations. But she provides for me some of the most valuable um, input because when everybody's gone, we talk a lot about what's going on. And, and she's really a great strategic thinker and a great, um, a, a great identifier of people and their personalities and, and what motivates them. And so we have a lot of really important conversations behind the scenes that people are never really aware of. You've got another sharp pair of eyes from, exactly. with another perspective. Exactly. And how old are your, your kids yeah. are actually going in the footsteps of landscape and, and land management, right? Pretty much, yeah. Mikio is that studied ethnobotany. And she's taking a little time off right now, traveling. But um, she'll go into a master's, either botanical garden management or education. And our son is studying um, architecture, landscape architect right now. What's your goal with the gardens? Where do you go next? What's your vision for the future? Great question. Um, we're right now in the process of, of developing a new five-year strategic plan, which takes the garden really to, to, a, to the next level. Um, in terms of both developing the funding base as, as well as uh, really tying us in with more international programs and, and making a global impact. At some point in, in the course of the next five years, we also need to begin thinking about planning for the future in terms of um, transitions and, and leadership. Um, while I'm not looking at retiring anytime soon, I think it is really important to think about transitioning the organization at some point to new leadership and, and assuring its sustainability. And that's never easy to do for, for somebody who makes that their life every day. But you've got to do it because you want the organization to go on. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We need to understand our role in the, in the global picture and how those factors outside of Hawaii affect what we're doing and as well as the fact that what we're doing here um, can be a leadership model to, to help um, others around the world. And, 
I think Hawaii has a lot to offer. We were at a meeting a couple of weeks ago that was convened by the United Nations on the global strategy for plant conservation. And several of us, of us from Hawaii went and gave presentations. And um, Hawaii is a microcosm of the world. We're dealing with all of those issues, whether it's endangered species, invasive plants, um, overdevelopment, uh, lack of water. We're dealing with it here. And, it, and yet we're dealing with it on a small enough scale that um, we, can, we can develop models that can then be scaled up and applied to, to larger areas. And, and I think uh, being able to put Hawaii on a world stage uh, will help us. It will leverage our work in Hawaii in a, in a tremendous way, as well as, I, I believe, contribute significantly to, to making the world a better place and helping other countries with, with their strategies. Do you ever resent the gardens for the, the toll they take on you? in your personal relationship? I don't think so. I mean, it's just a, a wonderful place to live, of uh, work. It's a very healing place to be in. Of course, some things are very intense, but um, it's all, it's, it's a, to me, the garden is a very healthy and healing place for us. And ha having common goals is huge. Exactly, yeah. We really do try and protect our weekends because those are, Having time for yourself, and, and, and even if it's just working in the yard or going working in the taro patch or walking in the garden or walking on the beach, it is important. Chipper and Haoli Wickman pursue their conservation and research efforts across the state, the continent, and around the world. They lead a frequent flyer lifestyle. A big part of their mission at the National Tropical Botanical Garden is to educate the public and share their tropical treasures. So if you get the chance, they'd welcome your visit to the award-winning gardens on Kauai and Maui, as well as in Florida. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. I accepted the directorship of that garden on three conditions. When our chairman of the board called me up and asked me to, to take it on, I said under three conditions. One is I'm the captain of the ship. I'm gonna have to make some hard decisions and you're gonna support it. Don't question it. Number two is we're going to make good on every promise we've made to the Hawaiian community there. And number three is I need some money. <laughs> <laughs>